Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, do you mind shutting the doors back there as we go ahead and proceed for 2020? Let's give yourself a big hand clap for being here. Good morning. I want to ask Google and Ashley to come up. Everyone, I just want to do a reminder. Our meetings are planned throughout the year by a committee, but these two have been leading, and I just want to give a big Yeah, I want to give a good appreciation to them. Uh, let's show them a warm welcome as well as they plan today. And the rest of the semester, do y'all have anything you want to say for the start of the new year? I start with my hands. New AD, you're still not used to it, but um, we'll close at the end with a few updates. And all that. Okay. So we're all getting used to new technology. As you know, they're only within a few 24, 70 hours of even opening the doors. Doesn't it look good in here with the lights and everything? In there? Well, let's start as we traditionally do. I'm going to ask if you're new to our division and you have, haven't had an opportunity to be introduced in one of our all staff meetings, um, could you please stand up? And what we're going to ask, if we have anyone, we want you to give your name what department you work in, and uh, what institution or area did you come from prior to coming to the University of West Georgia? Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Caroline Mashburn. I'm the new Assistant Director of Competitive Sports with UREP. Thank you. Um, I previously just came from Florida Gulf Coast University, down in Fort Myers, Florida. I was a coordinator over there. Um, prior to that, I was at the University of Mississippi. So happy to be here. Um, nice to meet a lot of you guys. And hopefully I'll talk to you guys later. Hey guys, my name is Michelle Lovern. Um, I'm a West Georgia alum, so I'm happy to be back here. Um, I was previously at KSU for a short period of time doing some admissions work, but I'm glad to be back. I'm also the new recruitment specialist over in Career Services. Hi, I'm Detta Evans. Um, I'm the record coordinator over in the ESC. And I started working here in 2016 as a student worker, so I've always worked there with Georgia. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Ariel Jones, and I'm the new budget manager for Center for Student Development. And I was previously across the street at the School of Nursing. Okay, everyone, big, big welcome again to all of you starting new to our family, and I say that because we work together as a team, and it's all part of a family at the University of West Georgia, and thank you for joining us as we start our first meeting in 2020 as an all division, and I will talk more about this later, but you've joined a student affairs team. Uh, the news is not official until March 3rd when it's published in the magazine. But I found out just two days ago that, again, we have been ranked as one of the most promising places to work in student affairs and higher education in the United States. Isn't that pretty nice? <laughs> What's so neat about that on that list is Ohio State and also Virginia Tech. But new this year is the University of West Florida. I mean, University of Florida. And uh, as you know, we've been on the list consecutive now every year since it's existing. And it's just a, a pretty neat honor. Well, without further ado, it, it brings me a pleasure to introduce Dr. Stuart Rayfield. I will let her speak in, in depth about herself. She promised to give us. I, uh, I requested about five or 10 minutes, 10 to 15, whatever we could get on a busy schedule. 
that she's had in helping West Georgia continue to be progressive and one of the best places to work, learn, and succeed. I want to tell you just personally, I've had a chance to see her even a year ago as I was at another institution shadowing the president, and she had a chance to come in and help that institution. And she sat down with leaders, genuinely listened, and moved pretty quickly to help with positive influence and change. And I've just been so thrilled to see her come here and work with the University of West Georgia team. Without further ado, I can just tell you personally, you're going to enjoy continually working with Dr. Rayfield. Let's give her a big student affairs and enrollment manager. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate it. Uh, I appreciate the invitation to be here today. It really is um, exciting. I started my career in student affairs. so. Uh, for the person who just started as a grad assistant in new student programs, that's exactly where I started. Um, so, and then that was my first real job, was director of, or coordinator of orientation new student programs um, and parent programs at Middle Tennessee State University. So, um, I will tell you that I have a real heart for what you do, and the reason that I do is because I'm standing here today because of a student affairs professional. And most of the people in this room can probably point back to that person who had an influence in their life. So for me, it was Cindy Pennington at Rhodes College during my undergraduate years. So I was one of those undergraduate students who rode a roller coaster where I was really excited to go away to school. And when I got there, I was homesick. And then I made some great friends. So these are my, I'm kind of doing it like this, but these are my lows, my highs. Um, but to the point where during my second semester, sophomore year, I tried to leave during the middle of the semester. Um, and so I was at a private liberal arts school in Memphis, Tennessee, which was not inexpensive. And my dad came up about five weeks into the semester. We loaded up his, um, his SUV with all of my stuff, we went to the registrar's office to withdraw me from school, and my dad said, so how are we gonna manage this refund? And as you can imagine, we're five weeks into school, so the answer was, I'm sorry, you don't get a refund. My dad looked at me and he said, we're gonna go unpack, <laughs> get back in your room. So then I ended up taking a semester off, but during that semester off, um, I really realized that there were a lot of people who were positively impacting me, and so I ended up going back um, to Rhodes. And then there was, Cindy Pennington was in student affairs, and I worked with her for the next two years that I was in school. And I left and was adamant that my undergraduate degree was gonna work for me, and I was not going to graduate school. So you can see how that ended up. But what happened was I ended up working somewhere for a little while, it was miserable, so I called Cindy and I said, hey, I want your job, how do I get it? And so she really introduced me to the idea of student affairs as, as a career and what that looks like and what it means. And so I say all of that to tell you that I know how important the work you do is because it's the reason I'm standing here today, and it's also what got me into this, and, and it's a, a seat that I used to sit in. So thank you for all of the hard work that you put in. It's not glamorous. None of you are gonna get rich being in this room and sitting in your job today, but the personal enjoyment and satisfaction of being able to watch students grow and develop over time is worth its weight in just about anything as long as you can pay your rent or your mortgage. I get that part of it. Um, but I do want to say that it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, my background, I told you a little bit about my very early background. Um, I really have spent a lot of my time in leadership. So from going from new student programs, um, really got into leadership development, um, and that became a big focus of my, my career in student affairs. And, when I went to Columbus State University back in 2006, um, I had been, prior to that, I'd been at Alabama, Middle Tennessee, Vanderbilt during my graduate program, and then Auburn. So I'd you know, had two to three years at each of those institutions. I come to Columbus State and have the ability to, um, to serve in a faculty role 
but still teaching leadership. And so that was really, I never expected to be a faculty member. I certainly never expected to work in a provost's office or do anything like that. Um, academic affairs, I didn't see myself there, but that's kind of where I landed. And it's really where all of my worlds collided in the most positive of ways. Um, you've, if you've heard me do any other introductions of myself along the way, um, I was at Columbus State for a while as a tenured faculty member. Um, I held an endowed chair position. I spent about 18 months um, working on our SACS reaffirmation. I co-led that. Um, so for the 10 years, and I lovingly say that's 18 years of uh, 18 months of my life, I will never get back. Um, but I learned a lot during that time. I got to participate in ELI um, as part of the system office. Um, system leadership development program. It's where I got to meet Xavier for the first time last year as he participated. And that was just a, a, a game changer for me, um, personally and professionally, um, working in that program. And so eventually I got a call because of that program um, and the connections that I made during the program to go serve as the interim president at Bainbridge State College down in Bainbridge, Georgia. And the way that it was described to me was that they were really struggling with their enrollment, that things were probably going to change there. This was going to be hard work. There was not going to be any glamour to it, but I would learn a lot. And so I, um, I, decided, I decided to pursue it and, and do it. I knew it would be a phenomenal experience. That being said, I called my husband after I got the, you know, the call about would I be interested. And I said, first of all, can you believe they would actually ask me to do that? They're crazy. Um, but it, it was only because, you know, I still had a lot of experiences to have. Um, but what, I, what gave me confidence was, is I knew what my gaps were. I knew exactly where I had a lot of strength, but I also knew where I was going to have to have strong people around me. And, and so it ended up being a fantastic experience. Um, I did kind of commute. Um, I had an apartment for a while, and when I introduced myself that day in Bainbridge, I said, most of you in this room are sitting here thinking, you have two young girls, and you're about to live away from them for a few days a week. And um, so, you know, in the back of your mind, you're thinking, how in the world is she gonna do that, and why would she do it? Well. When I first got the call, my, um, my husband and I, after I said, can you believe that? I was like, well, obviously I can't do it. And so over the course of the weekend, we talked about it a little bit. He finally came to me and he said, you know what, Stuart? If I had been offered this opportunity, we wouldn't be having this conversation. It would be a no-brainer. I'd be going, and you need to go too, because this is going to be really transformational for your career. I can handle this, and when you're here, you will be here. And so that's kind of how this all got started. Um, when I finished up at Bainbridge, we got to go through a consolidation. That's another year of my life I'll never get back. But, um, but it, was, it was, I can't tell you how much I learned during that process. Um, but when I finished up, uh, there was a, a vacancy um, at Gordon State College where they had a retiring president and they were in the middle of a presidential search and they needed someone to kind of fill that gap. So they asked if I'd be willing to do it. I said, absolutely. And so I headed over to Gordon. And so it's a very similar situation as to what I'm doing here at West Georgia. So I have a little bit of experience doing this exact thing, which is, you know, we have a president who has, you know, already left the institution. We've got a new president now that we know who it is um, who's coming in and said, I'm going to be able to serve as the transition person. And um, said, I have two goals for while I'm here. I'm very clear on what those two goals are. It's really kind of three. Um, but the first one is to make sure that we keep doing the good work of the university. We, we can't afford to press pause on what we're doing, to wait on someone new to get here. Um, we've really got to move forward, um, and at the same time, we've got to be reevaluating. okay, how are we doing what we're doing, why are we doing what we're doing, to make sure that we're re really meeting student needs. Um, and you all are the front line of so much of that work. So making sure that we don't press pause on what we're doing. 
that's the number one thing. The second thing, which is kind of a dual, is my job is, I see my job is helping the institution to get prepped up for the new president, and then the reverse of that, helping the president get um, ready to go at the institution. So that's kind of what my role is here. Um, I think it is, it's fun for me to come in to a new place because I get to learn a lot, I get to meet new people, and that makes me a better, uh, better in my role at the system office, which I haven't even mentioned. But So at the system office, I'm the vice chancellor for leadership and institutional development. I'll go back to that job um, on April 1st. And um, in that role, we're working on some comprehensive leadership development for the system beyond ELI, really actually leading up to ELI. And then the other thing is I go and I help institutions who are experiencing challenges for whatever reason and help them devise plans to move forward. And so that's kind of what I do. So every institution where I get to serve, I learn more about best practices. I learn more about different approaches to handling a variety of situations. And so all that goes into my toolbox along the way, those experiences. So what is unique about me coming to West Georgia and what made this something that was super easy to say yes to? Um, and I'll be honest with you, I would say yes to any of our 26 institutions to come and serve. Um, because I know I'm going to grow and develop in that process and hopefully I can have an impact while I'm there. But coming here was especially attractive because you all are doing some really great things and I want to learn about those things and how you're doing them. Um, I, a lot of times the institutions where I go, they're really, really struggling and have significant challenges. And that is not the case here. The case here is you've got some really great things in place, and I call on a lot of you over the years to help me at some of those institutions that are really, really struggling. Um, and so to actually be embedded in seeing how some of these things that I've heard about over the time, actually see how they work, is gonna be tremendous for me when I go back into my other role. So that's a little bit about me. Um, about my love for higher education, where it came from, um, and it came from those of you who are sitting in this room today. Um, I think there are a couple of questions that, um, they're here. They're you want me to? Yeah, you can pick any of them that you want. I'll kind of go down the list. I think I addressed some of them. Um, but, so what do you believe to be the key operational, the key to operational success at a post-secondary institution? This to me is a real easy one, a focus on students. If we are always asking what is best for our students, whether they are prospect students, whether they are applicants, whether they're first years, sophomores, juniors, seniors, or graduates, what is in their best interest and how can we serve them in the most meaningful way? The problem with that being the focus though is that every single one of our students is different and has unique circumstances. So we've got to be willing to get to know them, um, to know where they're coming from, to know what their aspirations are, to be able to work to meet those needs. So it sounds easy to keep students as our focus, but we've got over 13,000 students, so we've got to have, we've got to understand all of them in a meaningful way. Um, let's see. If you had the power to change one thing in higher education, what would it be? I don't know the answer to that. I think probably it would have to do something with affordability um, because I think that's a focus for us right now and our costs are continuing to rise, um, but we are, our commitment to keeping college affordable is creating a gap and so I'd love for it to be more affordable, but at the same time, for us to still be able to offer all of the great services and more. Um, there's some things that we're not able to offer at this point because um, we just don't have the funds to do so. So I don't, I'd, I'd rather reflect on that one, but kind of my knee-jerk um, response would be um, cost. The role of the university president, well, 
The role of a permanent university president is to set the vision and the strategic path forward for an institution. I told y'all what I think my role is. I've got my two goals, two slash three. Um, what are some of the things on your radar that you'll be working to advance during your time as interim president? Um, one of the advantages of having somebody like me who's been on a lot of our campuses and um, some other institutions outside of our system is that I have gotten very adept at asking lots of questions. And so I think part of um, my focus while I'm here is to ask kind of why, 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 why. But I think one of the things that can come out of me being here is really kind of getting everyone on the same page, singing from the same playbook, and really working as a team. You know, we, we have our divisions, so we've got student affairs enrollment management, we've got academic affairs, we've got information technology, business and finance, but the reality is, is that we all work for the University of West Georgia and the students who attend school here, and we've got to make sure that those organizational divisions do not create barriers for our students. So hopefully while I'm here, um, just by having that outside perspective, we can say, okay, why are we not doing it this way, or why are we doing it this way? Is there a way that we can do it in a more collaborative way that, again, serves our students in a more meaningful way? Um, why did you want to help lead this university, or why did I say yes to this? I think, you know, it was, it was really a no-brainer. There's just such good things going on here, and I'm learning every day um, what, what I can take back to some of our other campuses. Um, what has been your favorite experience or outcome of working with UWG so far? People. Without question, it's the people. Um, building these relationships. A lot of the folks on campus um, I've known a little bit or kind of have heard of along the way, but being able to develop these meaningful relationships has been by far the best part of it. Um, what role do you think faculty and staff play in advancing university goals? Well, we would never accomplish our goals without our faculty and our staff. I mean, it's our goals are towards student success, but at the same time, the heartbeat of the institution is going to be the faculty and the staff. Because if we're doing things right, our students come to the institution and then they leave, they graduate. Um, and hopefully they'll come back for additional degrees, but at the same time, the consistency across the experience um, for the institution is everybody sitting in this room and the faculty who are, who are teaching. So you all are the heartbeat of the institution. You create the experience. And I want to say something related to that, and I have no idea where I am on time, but I want you to think about this um, really, you know, it's a simple thought, but I want you to really give it some thought and think about how this embeds in your daily life. Every single interaction that you have with our students is an opportunity to keep them here or it's an opportunity to push them away. And you may be having a bad day, your computer may be on the fritz, your kid may be at home sick, or you may have um, you may have had a car accident on the way to work. Whatever those things may be that are affecting you on a daily basis and your mood and your demeanor, and that's real life. I'm not I'm not saying that you should always be perfect and happy, but remember that at your demeanor and the way that you approach serving students, always always is an opportunity to keep them here at the institution or an opportunity to push them away. And there are only so many times when they have that push away encounter that they actually go away. And so think about that as you go into your daily work this semester is what are the what are students walking away from your when, from an interaction with you? Are they thinking really want to stay here or this is just one more thing I'm going to add to the list because we have to say no to students on occasion. We absolutely have to. But there are different ways that we can say no to a student um, that still allow for them to feel heard 
to feel like they're important and that they're valued. And so I'm not suggesting in any way that the student is always right, because I think we all know that that is not true. But we want to serve those students in a way that helps them grow and develop. All right, a couple more. My Myers-Briggs type, I'm an ENFP. Um, so for those of you who are familiar with um, Myers-Briggs, I'm an ENFP. So, um, okay, very good. Um, let's see. Advice, okay, this is a good one to leave on. Uh, do you have any advice for the people in this room during this period of transition? Absolutely. Do your work like you've always done because regardless of changes in leadership, we need you doing your job. I think that now we've answered a lot of those big question marks. Um, we know who the next president's going to be. We know when he's starting. And so I've had two interactions with him so far and been wildly impressed by him in both of those interactions. He'll be here, um, y'all are the first to know. He's going to be here January 21st, I think, through the 23rd. We're gonna be setting up some meetings. So it is likely that we will pull you all together in a similar um, situation like this. Um, at some point during that time for y'all to meet him, um, I think you should feel confident that you have a very strong leader coming to this campus um, who is asking all of the right questions. He's wanting to see all of the data. Um, and so as you are thinking about your role, be thinking about how do you share your story? How do you share your story with him as you move forward? So keep calm, do your job, serve students, and you're going to be fine during this transition. Um, this is a scary time, and you've had a lot of change very quickly. Um, but we now have answers to a lot of those questions. So my advice is to do your job to the best of your ability and make sure that every time you interact with a student, they walk away from it saying, that was so helpful. That was a very positive experience. So I really appreciate what y'all are doing. Um, and, uh, over the next three months. Yes, thank you so much, Student Affairs and Enrollment Management, giving Dr. Stuart Rayfield another big hand. And we really appreciate her speaking with us today. And we had talked ahead of time, but I was so glad to hear Dr. Rayfield talk about do what you do and do your job, do the best that you do. Because a year ago, when I took lead, I said, let's do, let's be who we are and let's build off of what we do, we're the best. And so here we are a year later, I can't tell you how personally I feel grateful that again, we're ranked as one of the most promising places and just two nights ago I got the email to confirm that because that really means now a year later from last March, here we are getting ready to get to this March and we've continued to be who we are. And it's just one of many things a part of the review, but. As a leader, I'm so glad to hear that we're still moving in that direction. Come on up, Dr. Warlow and Dr. Jordan. Um, part of this meeting, I want to, us to share our story to where our division can hear from our great leaders about what we're doing in enrollment and that you'll get a chance to, to ask questions. Then after that, uh, there'll be a little bit about, I hope to answer any question about our budget savings and critical hiring. Um, because I want to make sure we're all up to speed as a division on what's going on in the university. As Dr. Jordan and Dr. Barlow get ready to share, I'll say this to you really quickly, what you've heard me say before. 15 institutions had a decline in enrollment. And this year we were one of them, and last year we were not. But even with our decrease at 3.6% of total enrollment decline, just about 67 to 70 percent of the institutions out of 15 that are on that list had a greater decline percentage in enrollment than the University of West Georgia. It is a time to where we are all working together to collaborate to recruit and retain our students to come to our university. But as a leader, I want you to hear me remind you, other universities are recruiting and they're wanting students as well. It's a competitive time in our higher education. It's good for students. But institutions, we just need to make sure 
that we can be efficient and savings as possible to adjust for enrollment time in the university and the country where it's a little bit declined. With that being said, how do I think we're going to get through it? Well, you're about to find out because Dr. Jordan and Dr. Barlow, they're very great leaders and they're working hard with the admissions office who's done great work to help us sustain through this time where it could have been a lot, lot worse. Okay. Let's give them a big hand. All right. Well, this is going to be an adventure because I, one, do not use microphones. Two, I uh, take two hours to do this presentation, and I have how much time? 20 minutes. So I'm going to count on someone that has always been willing to tell me when I've done something wrong, Ashley Pollard, to wave at me anytime as like, I don't know, every five minutes or something like that. All right, perfect. Let's do this. So I, I learn every day, uh, and I was sitting there listening to Stuart, and I realized that she did something really, really powerful, which was she actually told you what she wanted to get you to get out of her being here. So I'm going to do the same thing and tell you that it is my goal today to help you see what admissions does, because I think we did a really crummy job in my office, and I put that responsibility entirely on myself, of sharing with you what we do. Because what we do is really cool, and I think that it's important that we express that. And then also help you understand that everyone in this room plays a critical role and can do their part, just like Stuart said. Uh, from picking up a piece of trash to any number of other things, uh, you know, to what you do in just your programming, you can make an impact. So just realize that the goal here is to show you what's going on, but then to kind of percolate for you to think what you could do, and then more importantly, know what we're doing now as we move forward. And I'm going to be like a bullet train here, so just hang with me. I'm going to do my best and skip around a little bit, but do what we can. Here's the deal, I don't think that we have done a good enough job sharing with you guys what we do. So I do want you to know something. I want you to know that uh, we have a wonderful staff that is frankly coveted across the university system. Uh, I had the privilege to go work with Stuart um, because what we do is thought of so highly. And that's not because of me. That's because of the team that we have been able to put together. It's an incredible group of people. Uh, we make, people often say to me, travel to schools. We have 615 visits last year. The national benchmark for a school of our size is 500. You can see the emails, the text messages, the phone calls. Uh, we are very aggressive. I think a lot of people uh, feel like, and I don't think it's anyone in this room, but feel like, you know, hey, you guys should go to schools. You know, we're going to schools, okay? And we're doing good work and getting people excited about West Georgia. We run search campaigns. You can see there uh, the number of names we buy. Uh, one of the things that is often lost in admissions, people think admissions is just people going to schools. Um, frankly, what our type of student needs a lot of help navigating the process, okay? And so we have our operations team, and this is a historically low and complete rate for us last year at 10.39%. And you think like, oh, if people pay an application fee, they go through the process. That, that is not true. And so we go from getting them interested to getting them to apply to actually help them get through the process itself. And so when we think about admissions at an institution of our scope and size, it is all of those things. Uh, you can see there visits. We do all kinds of things, everything from we actually make decisions on site at schools, work with financial aid, bringing them there. We go through that whole series of things. And then I will just tell you that we've seen visit growth here of 17%, Alabama growth. Uh, I didn't see Zach here today, so he's somewhere traveling around Alabama right now. Um, but we are working really hard to create some realities for that. The last point I wanted to make is we did take over re-recruitment a couple of years ago, and we have been able to really grow that. That's where we are actually working with students who leave this university and inviting them to come back, encouraging them to finish their degree. And that's really what going to college should all be all about. It's having people, as Stuart said, take an interest in you, encourage you to go through the process, and find success. But like I tell people all the time, um, I can share with you everything that we did, but it did not work out the way that we had hoped. <laughs> so I always tell people that it's really important that we dig in and we ask ourselves what exactly happened. And I'm, I'm going to just tell you that we were down across the board. I use this as an example because I'm the only person who had never seen Avengers before. Um, because, but I saw Avengers and I saw that guy snap his finger and everyone disappeared. Okay, you know what I'm talking about? All right. I'm not him. Uh, and, and I was like, oh my God, that happened at West Georgia. Because it was like, 
was like Thanos came in and wiped out 16,000 inquiries, okay? And so that was an issue, right? And, and that really played through across the whole thing. It was like something happened externally that made an enormous impact on us. It is not that we weren't doing good work, because everybody here is doing good work. It's just that there are market forces, economic forces, and there's some other things that we're going to talk about. Um, I love showing this because uh, one of my dearest friends, Anthony Powers, put this together and it impresses everyone that ever looks at it. And uh, I want you to know something, teach you a little bit. Uh, this is applications coming in on an every two week basis. And uh, I always like to tell people, people always want to know, how will I know if it's going to be okay, Justin? And I always tell them, it's actually pretty easy because we get applications. Ah, this doesn't work. We get applications. Big time, up here in November and December, and then we get them again. Middle of February, after that, look at this curve. It stays tight all the way. These are all those different years, and those are the applications coming in across the board. We will know where we're at, and for anyone to tell you that we didn't know that it was coming, they're wrong, okay? We, we could see that the applications, low about right here, in January, fell by 360 year to year, year to day. And when that happened, we were in a tough spot, and it just continued all through the process. Now, what happened? Where did they go? Well, we are able to run them through Clearinghouse, which is a program that tells us where those students went. And we're going to show you that in a second, but you can kind of probably figure out by looking at this chart where they ended up going. Um, I have to be honest, when Anthony did this for me uh, from the, the semester enrollment report, I thought he screwed it up because there is no conceivable way that any school could grow by 38% uh, year to year. Uh, and it turns out there is. Uh, and that is what Kennesaw did last year. And I'm not going to talk a lot about Kennesaw, but what I do think people need to understand, if it helps you, is that I grew up in Kennesaw. I went to Harrison High School. And I was never going to go to Kennesaw because it was the local college. And I was going to go to this cool college called the University of West Georgia. We are inextricably connected at all times because of location, uh, because of the types of institutions we are. If you think about comprehensive tier, you've got Valdosta, you've got Georgia Southern. They're way far away. But one or two that are like literally next to each other, Kennesaw and University of West Georgia. So there is that interconnection. So recognize that Kennesaw had a big bump in this last year. And one of the reasons that I like to make sure people understand what happened in that is that two years ago, Kennesaw was ready to become this thing. They had Division I athletics, they were gonna make themselves more elite in their admissions process, and what they ultimately did was scare everybody away, okay? I mean, it was amazing. I mean, we saw our highest application count ever in 2018, and you wanna know why? they flooded into us because they didn't think they were going to get to Kennesaw. And that should have been our first clue that we are connected so tightly to Kennesaw. And what happened is we were sitting, I was sitting in rooms and we thought we were going to have so many people we didn't know what to do with them in 2018. But then Kennesaw rolled back their entrance and they made it easier to get in. And when that happened, it set off a chain of reactions that led to last year in which they said, okay, we're gonna market, we're gonna do all the things we need to do, and we're gonna make it a reality. And when that happened, it caused a decline. And when you look right here, I'm looking at a three-year average, because the critical piece that I want you to take from this is that you can't look at last year, you gotta look at over the last three years. And over the last three years, we saw ourselves losing 153 people relative to Kennesaw, 38 relative to Georgia Southern. So you can recognize there, and you can see some of these others. We did gain on Georgia Highlands, and I've heard the narrative that people went to no school. That is moderately true, but, but generally, we really did lose mostly our market share to Kennesaw as being a major factor. Location, uh, we lost, and I will just show you here, uh, if you look on where we lost, and then you look at where Kennesaw gained, you can see that in those areas, Gwinnett, Cobb, Coweta, and Douglas, those are where we lost, and those are where Kennesaw gained. So they definitely cut into our market share to some degree. There are a lot of factors in that, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about it. I will tell you, if you look right here at Gwinnett, Cobb, Coweta, and Douglas, many of people can commute to Kennesaw, and Kennesaw made the decision to waive the residency requirement. That's something we, we even should do here, because I believe in the transformative power of housing and residence life and their ability to change students' lives. And it is critical that we own that. But at the same time, we have a financial burden that we have to figure out. 
And so I will tell people that this played a critical role in that decline because we also deal with something. We deal with lower income students. And I want you to know something. I worked at Boston College, one of the top 20 schools in the country, and I hated every minute of it. You want to know why? Because those people didn't need my help. Been here for 10 years, helping to change lives, transform them, and help students get to where they want in life. And I like to work with people who need me. And our students need us. Over 50% Pell eligible, strong African American population, who, by the way, has our highest uh, GPAs and graduation rates. And I'm incredibly proud to be a part of that. And what I tell people all the time is that we count on them. They're high yield students. And what we saw last year is that we saw an African Americans decline by 8% in that new class coming to this institution. We saw financial aid, Pell eligible students decline here at this institution. We saw functionally a reduction of our very clear core student away from the institution. Where did they end up? Well, it's clear to me that they ended up at Kennesaw. Because for fun, if you look at this here, you can see that at Kennesaw, they went up of the students we're familiar with by 42% of Pell eligibility. And just for fun, look at this enormous number who sent us no FAFSA. That is because we, as, we assess, we don't really know, but Leanne has been great and we're working on this. We've got to do a better job of getting our financial aid award out, out faster. We're doing an incredible job of that this year. We're going to have it out in the middle of January. and We feel like that's going to make a really big difference in getting to folks. But Kennesaw was doing that then. So if we're going to really target the types of students that we want to support, we need to be mindful of the fact that we need to address the things that they need. Academic profile, I think it is important to see this. Because if you look at fall 2018, these are students who enrolled at Kennesaw from West Georgia, or, or who actually applied to West Georgia, you'll see they did attract a, a stronger academic. But look what they, look at 19. They dropped it down. So what I want you to understand is the very student we rely on is now their bread and butter student. And that means we've got to get after it in terms of providing service, doing the very things that Stuart said in terms of making every interaction count. Because ultimately, we have a, a large actor sitting functionally 45 to 50 minutes away from us, and we have to figure out a way to do what we do very well, be a best place to work in student affairs. And I know that we can do that. Uh, transfer, I do want to give you this point before I zip along. People think we have to find more people. I don't think that's true at all. What we do is if we provide them good service, do the things we need to do. You want to see an example? Transfer students. Transfer students who were admitted to this university who did not enroll. 42 is the second highest at West Georgia Tech. But guess where most of those students went? They went nowhere. 1,000 students were admitted to this university as transfer students, and rather than go to college, they just stayed home. That is a strong market that we can address. And that comes through doing transfer equivalencies earlier, giving the services necessary, doing the things that are necessary for our adult population as well. I'm going to skip major stuff and just come to this, because this is also numerics that I think are critical for you to think about. We all can play a role in this, because we have watched a decline in our yield for the many, many years. When I got here in 2009, and so I take a lot of responsibility for this, we were as high as 55% of admitted students enrolling at this institution. As of last year, we were all the way down to 42%. If we could just get that 13% back, we wouldn't know what to do with all the students. And I know there's a lot more to that, okay? But what you need to know is that when they come for a preview day and you smile one more time, or you help them get to that location, or they come to tour a facility and it's clean and, and the grass is cut and all those things, everyone in this room plays a critical role. Then they're gonna be more likely to choose us because what this is a picture of is lots of people are all admitted and then they're deciding to go to another school and you can play a role in that. And so as you think about that, remember too, we also measure MELT and what MELT means is that they actually have paid and often attended orientation but then they never quite make it to class. And that has grown from 7% in 15 to 11.31%. If you feel powerless today, I want you to get up from this table, your table and say, I am not powerless. I can play a role by providing the services I already do to help address mouth and how to, and how to address you. And don't lose sight of that as you go through this process. Now, I do want you to walk through one thing because I'm incredibly proud of it. <laughs> 
We engaged with a survey center here on this campus, paid uh, them their own college of social science, and we did something this university's never done. We surveyed several thousand of our admitted students who did not enroll and asked them why. Well, that seems like kind of obvious, right? But we had never done that here. And so what we found is that compared to our competitor institutions, they think that we have an absolutely incredible diversity. And they love that. And that's great. And that makes me very proud. But what you also need to understand is we have a tough road to hope. And we all need to play a role because academic reputation, and a shout out to Katie Ross who helped me figure out how to do this in a way that made any sense because it's a lot of information. But uh, admitted, not enrolled, if you look, this is what they think about our reputation. And you can see UWG is on the low end compared to these schools across the board. If you look at admitted reputation, you look at job placement. I'm not saying it's always true, but here's the reality in admissions. If they think it's true, it's true. And that is what I got to fight. I tell people this all the time. If anyone's familiar with the 1970s Playboy article that said that West Georgia was the top party school in the country, I still have people come up, parents come up and ask me about it. That is a real thing, okay? So what you need to understand is we, we have to deal with perception. Whether we, we all love this place and we know it is awesome, but we have to deal with it, okay? So just recognize that. Um, you're not gonna be able to see this. I'll be glad to share with anybody after here, but uh, we were, they were kind enough at the university system uh, level to actually do some analysis on jobs. And once students graduate from here, what their salaries are. And as you can see, in West Georgia, we've got to celebrate history. At one in five year, our graduates of the conference tier have the highest salaries, which is pretty cool. But the problem is, for a lot of these, they don't. And so we've got to continue to be thinking, and we also have to own the fact that the public has access to this. And they're going to look at that stuff. And if there's one thing mama and daddy want to make sure is that they're paying this money so that their little baby can get a, get a job and be successful. And that is why we have an absolutely incredible career service department doing everything they can to make that a reality. Graduation and retention rates, we all know this. But we need to own that the public knows this. Uh, I can tell you story after story of me presenting to parents and them literally pulling out their cell phones and pulling up graduation and retention rates. The day of hiding these things, they over. Okay? And we're going to have to figure out a way to bring them up, and I think we have cooperation with academic affairs to do that. But I mean, look at this. Compared to Kennesaw and Georgia Southern, our two biggest draws against our population, we have lower high school GPAs, SAT scores, freshman retention. I love this one, hope retention. That means people have to tell me, well, bring us better students. We're bringing you great students. These are students that are hope eligible, and we're in the bottom of the barrel when it comes to retaining them amongst our competitors. That is okay. The first rule of changing the world is knowing where you're at. And this is me saying, here we're at. And what I have heard and what I know, and it's just so really encouraging, is that our academic partners, our student affairs partners, are totally willing to get on board for that process. I want to end by just letting you know that we are not setting on our laurels. Our, our communications team, Chelsea Knox, uh, Katie Ross, and, and, and really everyone, have really been working hard to build publications that address those exact things, reputation, outcome variables. So what you're seeing in here, this went out to about 40, 50,000 people, but they're focused on not just saying we're affordable, but saying that affordability will help you do the things that will change your life. And so what we want to think about is how we shift perspective about West Georgia. So we're doing that with travel. And you can see, we have traveled more, almost 130 more between August and December this year, two visits, than we have uh, across uh, than all of last year. So we are out, we are active, our recruitment staff doing an incredible job. An, I did that for two years, it's an exhausting job. Uh, and then our visits are up, and I do want to share this because I do think that this is something that with student affairs collaboration we could really do more, and that is that we are actually sending buses to schools, picking up huge groups of kids, bringing them here and giving them days experiences. And what I'd love to see is, what can we do here in student affairs? If we have a group that's super into, I'm just using an example, like athletics, then how do we get them over to the stadium and have that experience for the day? It doesn't always have to be academics. People, I know you don't know this, but they don't always choose us for academic reasons, okay? So, uh, so what I want you to think about is, what could we build as an experience with student affairs so that we are making sure they understand that we truly are our best place to work? 
Uh, and then I will just finish by telling you we're doing all these things. Alabama is a big focus for us. We're kind of, uh, UCM was able to give us some resources in order to be able to recruit in Alabama. We have a full-time person there. Uh, and the other one I, I did want to highlight, because it was a lot of work from our team, is our academic renewal policy change. For anyone who doesn't know that, uh, we were able to uh, change our academic renewal, which is basically if you have a bad run in academics, you're able to bring your to remove those Ds and Fs, and we were able to get that from being at five years to three years. And why is that important? Well, it took many people in this room to make that a reality. And more importantly, we're now going to be able to serve students who struggled, give them a fresh start, but our competitors were able to do that at three years, and now we are also able to do it at three years. That's going to help our adult and transfer market. Uh, I, I guess I'll just end. I think we have questions. I, 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 did I make it? Lie to me. Okay, great. Thank you, Ashley. Ashley never lies to me, so I knew that would continue. Okay. Yeah, big hand for Dr. Boyle. I want Dr. Jordan to just uh, say a word or two about the Noel Levitz review. Um, and then the other piece I, I want to mention, is Anthony Powers in here? Could you please stand up? Can we give him a big appreciation for his work? The data and information he put together for Dr. Barlow and so on. And so we, what I want to say and mention as I hand it over to Dr. Jordan is, um, Justin didn't, he really didn't harp on this, but over 600 plus visits throughout the state of Georgia um, to go recruit students. And what I want y'all, and over a million plus phone calls, what I want you to know is, that's above the national average. Our teams work hard. We put effort in at the University of West Georgia. I can't thank admissions enough. But not only admissions, from financial aid and international students and Cal and all, we could go down the list. And as we get to the student life areas, I am very pleased to know that Dr. Adams and Ms. Anne Marie has been working with the student life units and we dove into our student affairs and enrollment management priorities to really accentuate and highlight how are we caring deeply about student success. Because what Dr. Barlow was saying, it's a competitive market out there, and students may choose to come visit us and may even be admitted, but they do have a choice to go elsewhere. And so how you interact with them, how you care about your job, and helping another individual grow and succeed in life, what I'm really saying is that it all matters. And so, Dr. Adams, keep pushing us forward on the care and the deeply successful students because it's in line with Dr. Boyle and Dr. Jordan for recruitment and enrollment. But the other piece that I heard really important is retaining them. Um, lastly, I'll say, the year before, 14, no, 13 institutions declined and West Georgia did. I'm going to remind you, that's because of the great work of admissions that held us steady. We tried to do that this year, but we are one of now 15 institutions. And I couldn't say it enough that it's really because people are working hard, but we're in good shape. It's just a, a tough time for enrollment. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I will, I will be brief and then be seated. Um, with r &L, they basically told us that our operation efficiency exceeds everything that we're seeing according to national averages. And it's because we are cranking things through our process. We have created efficiencies. Justin's team has done a great job with uh, leading on student leaders and uh, maximizing the ways that we're interacting with students and, and finding ways for us to overlap which we were not doing before. Where it's, students have questions about financial aid, well that's great, recruiters are not um, too keen on giving out financial aid information, why don't we take financial aid with us? And so we are looking to increase those partnerships or looking for ways to collaborate and I think it's really exciting for us because we're seeing that come to us from academic affairs in a way that we have not seen their partnership before or it felt a little strained or difficult. And so I, I am celebrating a decline in enrollment. And this is the only time you'll ever hear me say that out loud. Because what we want to do is then turn that momentum into change. And that's a change in relationships, that's a change in opportunities, but better, it's a change for our students. Because our student doesn't know what to do. 
our student body doesn't know or don't know, doesn't, don't, I'm feeling really confused on number at the moment. Um, they can't <laughs> do what they need to do. So it takes our village to get them there. And that village includes an emphasis on wellness because if they ain't well, they ain't staying. And so the faster we get on board with that, the faster that we talk about how our value of caring and our value of wisdom is being put to use to help students be successful at UWG, we're going to change the world. So I'm excited. I'm happy RNL said we're doing a bang up job um, and that four year public institutions have uh, experienced the least decline over the past 10 years. We're preparing for a cliff, so you may hear us start talking about a cliff, uh, but that is, um, that's coming up in the next five to six years. And so we have got to take what we're learning now and put it into overdrive. Because when we have less than 100,000 students in the state of Georgia graduating from high school, we are going to be experiencing some unique challenges in our admissions area as far as traditional 18-year-old students. So start getting creative, start thinking about adults, start thinking about military connected students. We're, we're going to keep hammering dual enrollment like it ain't nobody's business. But we've got to be able to, to capitalize on those other populations. So I don't think we can get it up with Q&A time, but I had just a really transformative experience yesterday, two hours with a faculty member and we only made it through six slides. But what I will tell you is, he didn't, it wasn't about blame. It was about, I want to learn, because I don't understand this, and now I want to help. And I want to offer that to everyone in this room. Um, it is, I would love, if you have ideas, or you just want to understand more, or you like it, um, I am more than happy to schedule time with you and go through your questions. You may not always like how I respond, but that's just who I am, but I will give you a straight answer, and we'll work together to find a solution. And actually, I'm going to hold us for about five or seven minutes because I do want to uh, answer any of you questions that you have because this is an important time as we set the tone for spring 2020 while Justin and Jennifer and I is up here. If there's any enrollment questions asked, but there's the other two I want to end with, critical hiring and budget savings. So does anyone have a question in the room on the first one about enrollment? Now that you've heard all this great work, from the admissions department and Dr. Borlo and then Dr. Jordan with enrollment. Yes. I have a question. When the planning is occurring for a lot of the am I am I audible? I can't hear you. Yes. Okay. When the I can't hear myself well, so when the planning is underway for a lot of the prospective student events such as uh, preview day and orientation. Is there a committee or some sort of a team other than those departments that kind of can maybe or is involved in that sort of planning? Um, and so in other words, is it just like new student programs and admissions or are people pulled in from other divisions or other departments to try to offer ideas at the onset to enhance those events that we have seen that are so critical to yield and, and those sort of things. Yeah, I, I, need, I do not need the mic. Uh, I, I would just say that our focus has largely been our academic partners. Uh, for anyone who's familiar with the history of this institution, we've come a long way with our academic relationships. Uh, and so we do have representatives from each of the colleges as well as the School of Nursing. They, uh, we bounce ideas off of them. They tell us what they're willing to do and not to do. Uh, I believe, you know, I guess I've been a representative from our division. Maybe that's a bad idea and we need to involve more folks. Happy to do that. Happy to get voices in. We can't always make everybody happy, but we are always looking for ideas. But again, our focus has mostly been on our academic partners. And I will talk for orientation. <laughs> um, we have the entire listserv that we go to when we're planning uh, our orientation events. And there are invites for planning. There are invites for preview and presentation. Did he come soon? And then there's the debriefs. So it's a very collaborative process. And I believe Nathan and April do, and Brett do, five different sessions with campus partners, whether that's just the NSP team, all the way to academic affairs, starts over service to student affairs and enrollment management, and then anybody else who did not fall into another group. Um, so those plannings and debriefs do happen from the new program's office. 
out, so we do all the assessment. We do an assessment report that comes out every September that kind of benchmarks what's happened in the past year. Um, but of course, the one-on-one -on -one meetings are happening constant, and so we meet, or we try to meet with departments at least um, twice, once in the fall and once in the spring, to kind of roll out what, what went well in the last summer and what's going, what does the change look like for the next one. And so if we haven't had it on your calendar, if we don't think you had enough face time, we're always willing to kind of sit down with you um, and talk about those ideas of how we can best integrate your information into our program. Awesome. Yeah, that was such a good question, Dr. Wyatt. Um, that you got a chance to hear the feedback, and I want to build on it to cap it. We've also expanded to an enrollment management group, and we, with the president and all the cabinet and vice presidents, but then deans and academic colleges are all <coughs> giving feedback in the enrollment process on how we can continually grow, grow, grow. Um, the truth is, in my leadership role here, what I noticed and have been very clear to Dr. Jordan and Dr. Barlow, as our division, we've just been We've been good for a while, but our secret has, um, we didn't talk that much about what you saw today, the great work that's happening in admissions and in enrollment, it was just kind of behind the scenes. Uh, now, very different time, uh, we are being more collaborative and transparent about that because the truth is, even if you think about what the state we're in now, we've declined in traditional undergraduates, as you saw from George, uh, Dr. Barlow's slide, not only yield, but overall for the last three years. And perhaps no one knew about it. So now you do, and now you have leadership that is being very forthright and out front with you, and we just need to talk about it. And we need to gather your feedback and be innovative as we move forward. Any other enrollment question, that was a very good one by Dr. Wyatt. Um, it all helps us. It helps us share more with you. If not, on enrollment, I'll just talk a little bit about critical hire and budget savings, and then just let you in on any last question. Thank you so much, Dr. Barlow. On the budget savings, the truth is we've already done pretty well, and Michelle's pretty nervous about it because she does the great work. Michelle Hawkins, last year we finished up with our uh, end of the year spending, and we balanced our budget, great like our division, all the many years before that. This year, um, a lot of our savings are ready for our division when we had a budget, budget challenge for the university. We made our contribution and um, we didn't feel the extent of that hit. Thank you so much to all the department leaders where we asked you to model a 3, 4%. Uh, now we may look at up to 5 to 6% uh, on how we can continually save. But the truth about budget savings, our division up to this point had already kind of encountered through our vacancies, openings on, on that process. Which leads me to the later one, which is, you heard me mention 15 out of the 26 public institutions in the state of Georgia has had an incline, decline enrollment. Well, the University System of Georgia instituted a critical hiring form to um, any hiring vacancy and planning to hire at any one of those 26 institutions now has to pause and go through a critical review hiring form to the very topic of savings around the vacancy, which impacts each of the institution's budget. I say that to give you the full background where you know not only is the University of West Georgia going through it, but it's not just us. It's a, it's a system and 26 school-wide process. Now, I need to talk about us. Our vice presidents have met with it. I turned, returned and spoke with our associate vice presidents and dean. And we know from our list of vacancies, um, Michelle Hawkins had already talked to me a month ago. We've been looking at those positions that were coming open. I want to thank you. I can't thank you enough for the hiring processes within your department you pushed through, even with the complexity of getting it posted online, which I know that, well, after December 15, and now as we get into January, uh, we pretty much have prioritized those groups on what's critical, what's important. We know every job we have at the university is important. But right now, as it goes through the planning of savings on what's critical to the operation, we're having to take a look at from the vice president level to the president, which goes directly to the chancellors. So it's a process where everyone's taking a look at if we've saved a little bit on this position, can we save 60 more days? And or if we can, is it critical? Can we stamp the approval to get it higher? Now, I want to tell you that I know that it's not an easy process, and I want to thank you for your patience 
And I want you to hear from me that uh, I know that it does, it pushes us a little bit on the efficiency on when we're having to pause positions. But we can do it. I want to give this time for you to ask me any question that you want as we end the meeting where I want you to hear directly from me. Please, the best that you can, be positive, work with your department leaders, uh, know that it's not their fault, they're answering to their associate vice presidents, and know that it's not their fault, they're answering to their vice president, and yes, it's all my fault. <laughs> and we can leave it there. And then I report to our interim president, who's doing a great job, Dr. Rayfield, and our cabinet, and we're all <coughs> really thinking through what goes from us to the, the system, and yes, the discussion, when we submit our positions, it has to be substantiated by critical to the uh, success, academic success, operational success, proven with documentation, and if any is rejected by the system, back to our cabinet, back to the vice president and me, back to you as directors and coordinators and department leaders. We look at that, and we don't want that. So forgive us when you hear your director or your associate vice president really working with you about the paperwork and what we're submitting. I want you to hear directly from me. We're taking that serious. Uh, and I want you to know that I'm thankful for you, and we're going to get through this time. And it does please me to know that even with all our challenges, the change of a vice president, the new information on enrollment decline, to a budget concern, you see me standing in front of you. You heard me say a year ago, we're going to keep going. And it does make me real to know that we didn't take a step back and we're moving forward because we got good leaders leading our departments. What last question that you may have, and I won't talk much after your question, I promise. Any last question? One more from here. I'm just glad you're asking the question and it's not just in Details. Well, our ABPs have said there's a form that's going around, and you're right, even with the form, it asks you those questions. Um, I would say do the best you can just to attach um, from your department how you know you hit the mission, how you know you hit the imperatives and priorities. And then anything that I share, uh, it's interesting when I say we're doing well on the budget because for our division, I gave Michelle Hawkins the credit, we have been doing budget savings six months before everyone's catching up. Um, well, this is no different. I'm not going to put just as uh, he's looking at me, he's like, what is he going to say? I'm not going to put emissions on the spot or Stephen with housing, but the truth is, even when they got ready to do the best of the best, engage West, retreats with their departments, they had to submit information, and it came to me, and they saw, I tagged on it, imperatives, priorities, with a quick, concise summary on how they're fulfilling the purpose within their department. So with your question, Dr. Wyatt, the ABPs have instructed, get it to them and our dean of students, and they're going to take your summary. I'm going to take a look at it. That comes by Friday. And then I have a deadline to get it to the president by Monday. So I'm going to work on the weekend, and then I'm just going to add a sentence or two to just attach it to those things, and we'll just work as a team. Um, but y'all are already doing the groundwork. I don't think you have to attach a big brochure or a literature summary on the doctor degree, but if you could just, you know, relate those concise things, that would be helpful. Did I, did I take a stab at it? Yeah. And I bragged on Justin and Steven just a little bit because they had a one-page document that they had to do how many months ago, Steven? Just six. Six months ago. So now you see everything I tell you is pretty pinpoint to what's going on substantiated. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you so much for all you did.